Hello, my name is Mark Francis. This is my story. So it's time to get out of bed and start moving. I have a lot of things to do. Today I have a beginning. You want to know what starts? Well, I'm starting the rest of my life. Day one? Yeah, here it is. Just the way it is. My life is small right now, but it's all I have. I work hard and try to do the right thing. I think I've been a good father. The kids are good kids. They are small and very active. Keith is eight years old and Andrea is six. They are great kids. They like school. Keith is in third grade and Andrea is in first grade. The children do not deserve what is about to happen. This is the consequences of their mother's actions. Let me take you back a little bit so you can see what's going on. So, the children. The children both look like their mother. They have her eyes. They have her smile. Neither one of them looks like me. But I'm not the prettiest guy on two legs. But I'm not ugly either. My height is six feet and my weight is 165 pounds. I run every day and work out a couple days a week. In the summer, I participate in competitive cycling. And in the winter, I ski. I have a full head of dark brown hair cut pretty short and all my own teeth. My parents spent a lot of money on orthodontics when I was a kid, so my smile is just fine. I wear glasses or contact lenses depending on what I'm doing. I'm 34 years old. My wife Karen is my age. We met at university. I'm an engineer and she's a web developer. Karen and I and the kids live in Albany, New York. I know Albany. The most boring city in the universe. Believe me when I say that life in Albany is, uh, is laid back. Don't get me wrong. Albany is a very nice city. I believe it is my life that is the most peaceful part. Some, and that clearly includes my wife, would call me boring. In my defense, the demands of everyday life, family, work, home, and all the mundane things that occupy our lives have shaped me to be just that kind of person. When there is time for adventure, we have to cram it into other demands. This means that fun is sometimes limited to weekends and summers. So this morning when I got out of bed and looked at myself in the mirror before my run, I thought, damn, what am I going to do? You see, I have a problem. I went for my usual jog and as I plowed down the sidewalk, I decided I needed to go visit my friend and talk to him. Jordan Walters and I went to high school together and grew up around the corner from each other. I know his family well and they know mine. Jordan is my friend and my lawyer. His practice is mostly wills, probate, and some business matters, but he also does family law. So I mentally flagged to call him. I got home around half past six after my run, put on coffee, showered, and got dressed. Karen was stirring and the kids were quietly stirring when I came down to the kitchen. I made the school lunches and got a sandwich and a piece of fruit for myself. It wasn't long before everyone was sitting at the counter on the other side of the kitchen island, crunching on cereal and toast. We made small talk about the day before, and I was reminded that there would be parent-teacher conferences at school soon. It's all good. I kissed everyone but Keith goodbye. Keith and I bumped fists. That was his new greeting. I headed out the door for another day of good old boring life. The day of parent-teacher conferences was also the day of my own meeting. It was a conference of two people. Jordan and I met at a coffee shop that was halfway between mine and his office. We shook hands, since I hadn't seen him in months, and sat down at a table. We ordered coffee and I ordered a slice of apple pie. Jordan was always focused, and he was no different now. After the coffee and pie arrived, he started. Okay, Mark, what's up? I need your help. I have a problem I need to solve, and before I do anything, I need some of your expertise. Okay, what's your problem? Karen. What the hell are you talking about? About the same Karen you've been married to for... Nine years? The same Karen who is the mother of your two children? The same Karen? I nodded my head, swallowing a mouthful of pie. Yes, that's her. Well, for heaven's sake, what's the problem? I took a sip of my coffee. Looks like Karen's been doing some sort of extracurricular activity for, I don't know, a while, I guess. I spent the next hour telling him what I knew. I was trying to find a way to salvage my dignity. Now I guess it was beyond me. Mark. I assume you want to know a little about me and my problem. That's fair enough. I grew up in Albany. Graduated from high school here and received a scholarship to attend Columbia University in New York. I'm a smart kid and have always done well in school. 
I think I'm a good person. I always try to do the right thing. I have a strong work ethic and I know the value of my family. I come from a good home. My parents taught me a lot about life and laid a strong foundation of values. They taught me to put my family first. And with my wife and two children, I see that lesson every day. My problem is that my wife has different ideas about what is important to us as a family. Karen is dating another guy. I'm not sure I can live with that. But I don't know what to do about it. That's where Jordan came in. I needed his advice both legally and as a friend. So what do I do? Jesus, Mark, you're in a bind. Jordan sipped his coffee and looked down at the table. He exhaled heavily as he began to speak. Okay, there are two approaches you can take. The first I will tell you as your attorney. The second I will tell you as your friend. I looked at him and nodded. First, and this is what my lawyer says, you're going to lose if you decide to divorce Karen. New York family law is mostly on the wife's side. Karen will in all likelihood get custody of the children and with her, the house. Unless you can prove that she is a bad mother, the court will award her custody of the children. You can ask for custody, and if she objects, the court will almost automatically give custody to her. Jordan took another big sip of coffee and signaled the waitress to pour another. I was about to speak when he held up his hand for me to wait. A fresh pot of coffee arrived. Along with the kids and the house, you're going to be paying for a bunch of stuff. A big chunk of the mortgage in proportion to your salaries, child support until they turn 21 or graduate, and probably an amount for Karen's maintenance. It used to be called alimony, now it's called spousal support. Heck, things were getting complicated. But the real fun was just beginning. Jordan went on to tell me tons more information I needed to know. A quick guide to divorce in New York. There are seven grounds for divorce in the state. An irretrievable breakdown in the relationship for at least six months. This ground is commonly referred to as a no-fault divorce. To use this ground, the marriage must have been dissolved for at least six months, and all economic issues, including debts, division of marital property, child custody, and support, must be resolved. Cruel and inhuman treatment. To use this ground, the judge will look for specific abuse that has occurred in the last five years. It's not enough that you and your spouse fought or didn't get along. The abuse must get to the point where the plaintiff is physically or mentally in danger, and it is unsafe or impractical for him or her to continue living with the defendant. Abandonment. To use this ground, the spouse must have abandoned the plaintiff for at least one year or more. Two examples of abandonment are when a spouse physically leaves the home with no intention of returning, or when a spouse refuses to enter into a relationship with the other spouse. This is called constructive abandonment. Imprisonment. To use this ground, the spouse must have been incarcerated for three or more consecutive years. The spouse must have been incarcerated after the marriage began. The petitioner can use this ground while the spouse is in prison or for five years after the spouse is released from prison. Adultery. To use this ground, the plaintiff must prove that the spouse committed adultery during the marriage. This ground can be difficult to prove because evidence from someone other than the plaintiff and spouse is needed. Divorce after a marital separation agreement has been entered into. To use this ground, the plaintiff and defendant sign and file a valid separation agreement and live apart for one year. In order for a separation agreement to be valid, certain requirements must be included. Divorce after a judgment of legal separation. This ground is not often used. To use this ground, the Supreme Court issues a judgment of separation and the spouses live apart for one year. My eyes began to glaze over as Jordan continued his lecture and talked about divorce New York style. So, Mark, the most likely grounds for divorce, if you have chosen that route, are irretrievable breakup or adultery. To prove adultery, you will need actual evidence. Either Karen's admission that she is having an affair with another person, or for the person she is having an affair with to come forward and say so themselves. Or other proof. I took a deep breath and looked at my friend. I knew the look on my face wasn't the best. Jordan continued. Another point is the irretrievable destruction of your marriage. It is what most people cite as the main reason for divorce. He paused for empty effect. You might want to think about that before you make a decision. I was at a loss for words. I had no idea what to say. Jordan took a deep breath and continued. Okay, I've told you what I should have told you as your attorney. Now I want to talk to you as your friend. 
I looked up from the depths of hell I had sunk into. I was hoping for a lifeline. I needed something to tell me that my life wasn't over, that the comfortable life I was enjoying with my family would continue. I needed to tell him, Jesus Christ, Jordan, I really hope you have something better in your arsenal than the misery you just described. Dude, you need to figure out what you want. What do you mean? I want my family. I want my wife and my kids. I want my life to go on with them like before. That's what I figured. So what I'm going to tell you, you have to listen and think about it. You have to realize what's most important to you. Is it your family or a little bit of your dignity and ego? Oh, what do you mean? Look, I see all kinds of people who go out of their way to do as much damage as possible. The whole scorched earth thing. They sacrifice everything just to make the other person miserable, and they end up making only themselves miserable. Jordan paused to let that sink in. Another big loser in divorce is the children. You have to realize how much you want them to suffer. I lifted my head and looked my friend straight in the eye. What? Yes, the children. Your children, they will lose the most. He paused again. They're going to have to get used to only seeing you a few days a month and every other holiday. You'll have to get used to being a part-time father. Karen will get custody and you'll have plenty of time without them. You can count on that. Damn it. What am I supposed to do? Jordan, what am I going to do? I couldn't believe what he had just said. You hear stories about fathers who barely see their children. Fathers whose divorce has essentially ruined their lives. I didn't want to be one of those victims. No. Jordan looked at me with a mixture of sadness and amazement. He was a good friend, but he was also a realist and saw the effects of divorce every day. Mark, can I make a suggestion? Of course you can. What kind? It might sound a little different, but I've seen it work. What? The decision is yours and yours alone, but if I were you, I'd seriously consider it. Please tell me. Do nothing. What? Do nothing. Do nothing. Go home and pretend you don't know anything. Go home and go on with your life as you have been. Go home and enjoy your family. Go home and do all the things you normally do. Go home and play with your children. Go home and make love to your wife. Go home. I, I, are you serious? Like a goddamn heart attack. You told me you almost never discovered Karen doing it outside of marriage. You told me you never noticed anything different. You told me that she has always been a great wife and a wonderful mother to her children. You told me that she cares about her family and always puts you first. You told me she's a good wife. But... But nothing. I told you that you have to make your own decisions about what you want to do, and that's very true. But you have to decide for yourself if you want to ignore what you've learned for the sake of keeping your family life intact. Think about this. How badly do you want your family? Enough to sacrifice the knowledge that Karen isn't being very honest with you? Enough to push aside the knowledge of her cheating? Enough to pretend that everything was unchanged? We were both finishing our already cooled coffees. The waitress cast sideways glances at us, signaling that it was time to order something to eat or pay and move on to take seats for paying customers. Oh my god, shit. I exhaled like I'd been holding my breath for hours. I need to think about this. Jordan stood up and I followed suit. We both threw a $20 bill on the table and headed for the door. Once we were outside, Jordan turned to me and said, I need to get back to the office. Call me anytime you want to talk. Let's meet for a beer Friday afternoon and you can tell me what's going on in your head. Until then, promise me you won't do anything. Okay? Okay, I promise. Look, thanks for listening to me and thanks for the advice, I guess. I've got a million things swirling around in my head and I need to do some thinking about it all. We went our separate ways. I walked back to my office trying not to cross the road. I got home and followed Jordan's advice. I was no different than anyone else when I got home from work. I kissed my wife and talked to the kids as usual. Karen was on her usual behavior. We had dinner, I helped the kids with what is considered homework these days, and then we played in the driveway, throwing balls into the basketball net I had set up. All very normal. After the kids got ready for bed and retired to their rooms to read, no screens, just paper books, I decided to just watch Karen. I tried to memorize everything that attracted me to her. 
Her smile, her figure, her eyes, the curve of her hips, the way she moved. I fell in love with her at first sight. I knew she was the woman I wanted to spend the rest of my life with. She was the woman I wanted to have children with. So what the hell happened? Where did we get lost? Looking at us as a family, no one would have thought we had any problems. We looked and acted like a normal family that loves each other. We held hands in public. We kissed. The kids ran to us if they had a problem, if they needed to blow their nose or tickle their nose. We had fun. We were a team of four. I would walk around the house and list all the many projects Karen had done. She was great at decorating the house and even doing repairs. This woman was tireless. She went through almost every room of our house and made many changes from simple painting to trim, cabinet making, doors, and even bathroom renovations. I was the primary laborer on many of these jobs, but she was the brains behind the design. Where did she find time to have fun with other men? Hell, sometimes I barely had time to go to the bathroom. My wife was a master of deception. But you want to know how I knew she was getting it from someone else? Fair question. At my job, I often meet with clients to discuss their needs for a project our company is building for them. Usually the meetings are held at our offices, client offices, or construction sites. Sometimes we hold meetings at other locations. That day we held the meeting in a small conference room at the Hilton Hotel. The clients were not from Albany, had only traveled there for a meeting and were staying at the hotel. They organized the conference room. They even organized a lunch for us. During lunch, I decided to go outside for a few minutes and get some fresh air. I was going to take a walk around the block to stretch my legs and think about a problem we had with the design of the building we were going to build. As I was walking back to the hotel, a cab stopped in front of the entrance, and a tall man, about 35, 40 years old in a very expensive suit, got out of the back seat. A woman got out behind him. She looked remarkably like my wife. I walked up to the same entrance they were entering, just 100 feet behind them. He took her hand and they hurried into the hotel. I moved at a good speed and almost caught up with them as they entered the elevator. As they entered the elevator, they were the only ones in it, they turned around. He had his arm around her waist and I could clearly see it was Karen. She said something to him as the door was closing and he leaned over and kissed her on the lips. My world stopped. I stood in that spot for almost 10 minutes, trying to comprehend what I had just seen. I shook my head. I needed to remember how to breathe. My chest tensed up. I thought I was having a heart attack. My legs wobbled and I walked over to a chair and sat down. I sat like that until one of the meeting attendees walked by and asked if I was going back to the meeting. I went back but didn't hear anything that was said. Good thing there were minutes kept at the meeting so I didn't mess up the contract. I went home right after the meeting ended, expecting Karen to be packing to leave me. She was there tending to the kids and making dinner. She greeted me the same way she did every night. That was a few weeks ago. Since then, I'd been agonizing over everything. Karen, our marriage, the kids, my life in general, how damn stupid I was. All of it. I was a mess. And that's when I decided to start making a plan. But I needed help. So I went to talk to my buddy Jordan. Jordan? I can't believe the shit that Karen is up to. After Mark came to me, I knew there was going to be some changes in his life. I knew he was going to have to do something. Although I warned him that the divorce would be very hard on the kids and himself, I know that a man can only take as much as he can handle. But the thing is, you have to realize what is most important to you and take care of that first. Everything else comes second. In Mark's case, he decided that the kids were the most important thing and his interest came second. So he put up with Karen and her other life. I hired my regular investigator to make some inquiries about Karen. I wanted to get a much better idea of what she was up to before I told Mark. If he knew the whole story, it could kill him. Mark. Time heals all wounds and wounds heal all. I heard that somewhere. I'm not sure if it's true. All I know is that I managed to swallow my pride and pretend I didn't know anything. And that's the weird thing. If I hadn't seen Karen go into the elevator, I might never have known anything. Karen is still the same person she's always been. She is a wonderful mother and fiercely protective of our children. She is organized and hardworking. To me, she is the same woman I met and married 10 years ago. But now she isn't. I still don't know what to do. Do I stand up to her and kick her to the curb? Do I try to talk to her and try to work it out with the help of a marriage counselor? What if she's the one who wants to get rid of me? 
what, 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 what will happen to the kids? If Karen is in love with this guy and wants to leave us for him, I don't know what to do. That's where Jordan comes in. He's my bargaining chip. He's my man to help me figure out the intricacies of this crap show. Jordan. So I asked my investigator to do some work. Wolfie is a very good investigator. Her real name is Hannah Wolfenstein, but her friends and family call her Wolfie. She is a former police detective from New York City who was shot in the knee and medically discharged. She is only in her early 30s, divorced, tall, blonde, slender, and very pretty. She fits in well in many places and is therefore very good at keeping tabs on people. She has a wide range of technical tools at her disposal. She is my go-to wand for information. She rarely disappoints. She is also not cheap. But in this world, you get what you pay for. I called Wolfie and asked her to come by my office. When she showed up, I immediately got a boner at the mere sight of her. She has that effect on men, all men. Her knee is almost back to normal by now, so you hardly notice any problems when she walks. She walked in, and after I brought her a cup of coffee, we started, Jordo, what can I do for you? She calls me Jordo. I have another wife who is leaving her husband. This one is the wife of one of my best friends. I handed her the file folder we'd compiled on Karen. It contained her places of employment, addresses, phone numbers. A picture of Karen, her car and license number, and a brief bio including height, weight, and anything else I thought might be useful. I could have done anything, but Wolfie handled the part that was more obsessive. She had the resources to dig deep into people's lives, including their financial affairs. I sipped my coffee and continued. Her husband spotted her at the Hilton Hotel downtown with a man who is much friendlier than a friend should be. Most likely this guy is a friend with benefits. I want to know what and with whom she is doing and for how long. Anything you can get will help her husband decide on a possible divorce and what we use as grounds. Bottom line, I need leverage to make sure he gets custody of his children if it comes to that. Wolfie nodded and took new notes as I spoke. She had done this before, and I was sure that whatever Karen was up to, Wolfie would figure it out. She looked at me. You know I don't work for free. I need a regular fee and my regular hourly rate. She wrinkled her nose. It will take me at least three hours to develop a plan and conduct an electronic search. I'll contact you in two days with a more accurate estimate. Will that suit you and your client? Great. He's a very patient man, but he needs information before he does anything. We'll talk in two days. Wolfie gathered up the folder, put it in her oversized bag, and stood up. Reaching the door, she stopped and turned slightly. You do remember you still owe me that dinner, don't you? How could I forget? Hannah. Damn it. I hate stupid women who think they can do whatever they want to their unsuspecting husbands and get away with it. I've seen too many of these smug bitches who have fun with the men they rely on to keep them content and pay for the life they want. My client is a hard-working and dedicated family man who was given a hard time by his wife when he happened to see her walking, holding hands, with another man, and making out with him in the elevator of a top downtown hotel. According to Jordo, he doesn't want to kick her ass to the curb, but wants to know what's really going on and wants to know what his options are. I've encountered this kind of thing before. From what Jordo said, the client wants to keep the family together if he can. But I know you can only do so much before you want to, uh, explode? There are limits. I have seen men who are rational, logical, and very in control of their lives go crazy and do things they later regret. Now I need to find out what Karen Francis represents. I suspect that Mrs. Francis has done this sort of thing before. Either she is very comfortable in her actions and has gotten a little lazy in hiding her infidelity, or this was her first time. I'm not sure, but I'm going to find out. I'm going to email Jordo my estimate, and then when he gives his approval, I'll get to work. Mark, three weeks later. I got a call from Jordan. His investigator has been working hard and should be able to provide me with a report. I hope to hell that what I saw was just something that has an explanation. If it is something more than that, however, I don't know what to do. When I got to Jordan's office, he led me into a small conference room, and I could tell by the look on his face that what I was about to learn was not what I had hoped to hear. Introductions were made, Jordan began. Mark Wolfie has managed to find out a lot of information. She's going to go over it, and then I think we need to discuss it. In short, you are correct in your suspicions that Karen is involved with another man. Let Wolfie tell the rest. I turned to look at the investigator. 
Mr. Francis, I started looking into your wife right after Jordan told me what you wanted to know. I have been able to learn a great deal about Mrs. Francis, and I regret to inform you that your wife has been involved with another man for an extended period of time. I grabbed my water bottle, drank it, and ran to the bathroom. The water, along with everything else I had eaten in the last 12 hours, went down the toilet. Everything in the toilet swirled, and I think I blacked out for a few seconds. The next thing I knew, Jordan and Hannah were holding my head. He put a towel under my chin, and she was washing my face with a wet washcloth. It took a few minutes, but I was able to get back into the conference room. When the world stopped spinning, Jordan asked if I wanted to continue or stop and do it another time. I had to take a few deep breaths, but I replied that I wanted to continue. Better to get it over with now than stall for time. Hannah started again. Mr. Francis, we've done a detailed electronic search of your wife. I have to say that there is very little information about your wife on the internet. I know she works as a web developer, so she has the tools and ability to manage what is known about her. She has a Facebook page, and that's it. She doesn't use any other social media. Everything she posts on Facebook is family-oriented. It's the most basic, mundane information. There are a few pictures of you, her and the kids, all very innocuous and show you doing something family-oriented. I looked at her Facebook friends and studied them to see if there were any disguised ones among them. I looked at her with a questioning expression on my face. I mean, are there any of her Facebook friends who aren't who they're trying to say they are? That would give them the ability to write direct messages to each other and then delete them so you or anyone else wouldn't see them. We haven't found anyone who isn't a real person. That doesn't mean your wife hasn't created a fake account under a different name, an alias. It's pretty common, and it's hard to detect if she's logging into that account from a device you may not know about. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Hannah looked at me and continued. So we had to resort to good old-fashioned methods. We attached a tracking device to your wife's car and followed her movements. For the first week, we simply tracked the various places she visited and weeded out the obvious ones. Work, home, your children's school, the supermarket where you usually shop, and places like that. We then decided when and where we would follow Mrs. Francis and observe who she met and what she did. It was only then that we were able to get down to business. Oh my. The second week, we installed a listening device in Mrs. Francis's car. It was able to record everything that was said in the car. The recorder is voice activated and is designed to filter out the normal noises of the car and the sounds of the road. It also allows us to access it remotely to monitor the conversations that take place in the car. It was through it that we were able to learn that Mrs. Francis was planning to meet with a Mr. Thomas Murray. Do you know him? I shook my head. No. She took a sip of water and continued the infernal litany. We made inquiries about Mr. Murray and found out that he is a corporate attorney currently assigned to the state of New York in the state comptroller's office. He is assigned a procurement and contracting project. It seems the state has decided to outsource the project. The rest is irrelevant. We did a detailed search on Mr. Murray and found that he is married to Brittany Murray and they live here in Albany with their daughter Allison. Hannah handed me pictures of Thomas Murray, Brittany Murray, and their daughter and the house they live in. She asked, does it look familiar or does the house look familiar? I shook my head. Not really. He could be the man Karen was with. To be honest, I wasn't following him at that moment. I was following her. We found out from the tape recorder in Mrs. Francis's car that she had planned to meet Mr. Murray at a hotel on the east side on Wednesday of last week. We were there and watched them go into the hotel and got these pictures. She handed me some pictures of Karen with him. They were holding hands. It seemed like they could have been doing it right there in the hotel lobby. She was holding his hand. Hannah waited for me to take it all in before continuing. Once we found out who Mrs. Francis was dating, we were able to do a detailed background check on Mr. Murray. We believe that he and Mrs. Francis were a couple at the university before you met her. The room spun again. Jordan handed me a paper bag and told me to breathe into it. It helped a little. Hannah was looking at Jordan trying to figure out whether or not to continue. I looked at her. Keep going. I took a sip of water. We checked university records and found out that Mr. Murray was a third-year student when Mrs. Francis was a freshman. They dated for two years, at one point living together for a year. It was at that point that they broke up and Mrs. Francis moved into the dorms. I think you met her shortly after that. 
Were you able to find out why they separated? Yes. Mr. Murray went to law school in North Carolina. There he met his wife, and they were married just as he graduated. Their child was born about six months after they were married. She got pregnant by him. Yes. When did Karen start seeing him again? We're not exactly sure, but when we looked for his financial records, we found that he has a separate bank account that isn't linked to any of his other accounts. My guess is that he keeps it a secret from his wife. It is from that account that he pays for his hotel room almost every week. Does Karen have a secret bank account that she's keeping from me? Hannah hesitated for a moment before answering. I knew immediately what the answer would be. Yes, there is. It's set up at a credit union near her office. We've determined that she has about $40,000 in that account. I looked at Jordan and Hannah. Where the hell did she get that kind of money? I do the taxes and it's pretty simple. We save every month, but not here. We believe she was siphoning off money by taking two paychecks. One, about 75% of her paycheck goes into your joint account and the other 25% goes into her own. She also has a separate credit card at this credit union. She also has a phone that she uses to call Mr. Murray. Oh my God, my wife is leading a double life. What the hell? Hannah turned to look at Jordan. He looked back and nodded. Then he spoke. Mark, we have, we have some more information you need to know, and that's the hard part. How the hell could it be more complicated than that? Jesus, Jordan, how much worse can it get? Well, it's not what I was hoping for, but I think you should know that. You have a right to know it. Now I was really puzzled. Okay, tell me what it is. Jordan, with the most depressed expression I had ever seen on his face, said, Go ahead, Wolfie, tell him. Mr. Francis, when I find out there is a long history of infidelity in a case, I automatically expand the search parameters to include other family members. Last year, you made the school the kids go to take cheek swabs for DNA testing in case of kidnapping or some other disaster. Well, we accessed your children's DNA and compared it to yours and Mrs. Francis's. The results on Mrs. Francis were as you'd expect. She's the children's mother. When we compared your DNA to the children's, we determined that, uh, you are not their biological father. What, 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 what? Sir, I'm very sorry to have to inform you that you are not Keith and Andrea's biological father. I couldn't believe my ears. That's impossible. You must be mistaken. Jordan spoke up. Mark, I know it's hard to believe. We used your DNA from a paper coffee cup last time you were here and we've tested it twice, but we're sure someone else is the father of your children. My planet stopped spinning again. I couldn't breathe and was about to pass out. The room spun again and I had to lie on the floor. In the time it took Hannah to tell me about the DNA tests, my whole world just crumbled. I have a cheating wife and I have no children. As you can guess, it took me a while to digest what Jordan and Hannah told me. She had a very well-prepared written report, and she even had it on a memory stick for me to use. Jordan had a complete copy for his personnel file. He figured he would need it later on for his divorce settlement. I had a question for Hannah. Have you been able to establish who is the father of my children, Karen's children? We haven't gotten that far, but if you want, we can do certain things. Collect DNA from another person and compare it to the children. I nodded at her. Please do that. I want to know who the man who is their father is. I'm assuming it's Thomas Murray. Hannah looked at Jordan, then at me. He is the one we believe to be the biological father of the children. Okay, do that. I want to know. I paused for a moment. I don't want to know how you do it, but please find out and tell me. We finished. Hannah gathered up all the things she had, put them in a folder, and handed it to Jordan. She stood up and started to leave. Mr. Francis, if anything, except for the short time you spent with Mr. Murray, I think Mrs. Francis is really quite fond of you. She has all the outward signs of a woman who loves her husband. I know that doesn't mean much now, but think about it before you do anything. One last piece of advice, if I may. Please don't do anything stupid and go to jail. It won't do you any good. Hannah turned, looked at Jordan, and gestured for him to follow her. They walked out into the hallway outside the conference room and talked quietly. I saw her nod her head in my direction a couple times before kissing Jordan on the cheek and walking away.
I assumed they were friends with occasional benefits. Jordan returned. We sat in silence for a few minutes. Then he stood up. Come on, you're coming with me. Karen. I know what you're thinking. Is it normal to be married and have a lover? Yes, it is normal, at least to me. And as far as I know, relatively common for married people to love someone other than their partners. It happens more often than you might think, but not all people who fall in love with other people end up married. I love Mark. Very much. And at the same time, I love Tommy. You think I'm crazy and a cheating bitch. You can think what you want, but this is my life. Mark doesn't know about Tommy. And Tommy's wife doesn't know about me. And we both want to keep it that way. We spend one day a week together. That's it. We've been doing that for years. I've loved Tommy since before Mark and Brittany and I were married. Before either of us had kids. Tommy met Brittany when he was in law school and she got pregnant. He did the right thing and married her. Our relationship ended, and that's when I met Mark. We dated, and I fell in love with him. We got married, and shortly after that I met Tommy. We started dating again. We never stopped loving each other. But now we both had other commitments and other lives. I know it's wrong, but I couldn't help but see Tommy. Mark was my husband, and I loved him dearly. But Tommy was, I thought, my true love. The problem was that we both had spouses to whom we were committed, which meant our love for each other was secondary. We started seeing each other once a week. It was a regular thing. A few months later, my period disappeared and I found out I was pregnant. Mark was ecstatic at the news that he was going to be a father. I didn't know who was going to be the father, Mark or Tommy. It didn't matter at that point. After Keith was born, Tommy and I took a break, considering the demands of being new parents. Mark took to the role of father like a duck to water. He's a wonderful father. He's tireless. He would work all day and then come home and take over parenting to give me a chance to shower and rest. I was used to being a mom, and it didn't take long before I had my shit figured out and could walk and chew gum at the same time. When Keith was about a year old, I got pregnant with Andrea. Those three years were a challenge, but they were wonderful times. My husband is my hero. He makes my life with him and the kids a joy. The time I spend with Tommy is the entertainment I need. He makes me feel good about myself. He does things for my psyche that Mark can't do. I don't mean to say that Mark is a less worthy husband, person or man, no, not at all. They are different. I want them both. I want them both. I can only have so much Tommy. Brittany has the most of him, and rightly so. I have all of Mark. He shows me every day that he loves me and the kids. I know we are his world. Mark. I had to ask Jordan to drive me home in my car. He took a cab to his office. I walked into the house and just walked around looking at things like I had never seen them before. I walked over to Keith and Andrea's bedrooms and looked at them. I remembered all the times I had read them bedtime stories, nursing them when they were sick with colds, changed their diapers when they were babies, carried them in my arms around the house, walked them around the floors with them at night to get them to sleep. They were my children. They had my last name. My name was on their birth certificates. How could Karen lie to me for so long? Why would she do that? If she didn't want to have children with me, why didn't she tell me that? Why did we get married in the first place? Why? We repainted and decorated the kids' bedroom several times. When they were newborns and then after they went to school, we redecorated, added desks, changed paint colors, and made the rooms our own. They helped pick out furniture. I walked into our family room. On the walls hung framed pictures of us as a family. Some were taken during vacations, and there were more formal family photos taken at Christmas. They capture the growing up of the kids and us as a family. Why did she have to go and ruin everything? Why did she have to turn our marriage into a lie? Why did she have to take away one of the most important things to me? Do I hate her now? I loved her and now I hate her. Why was she so cruel? I don't know what to do. I have no idea what I can do. Jordan was right. Don't do anything yet. I don't want to hurt the kids. I have a lot of things to figure out and then make some kind of plan. Karen. I got home from my meeting with Tommy just before Mark got back. I can always find out where Mark is by his phone. I use the Find My app. It works really well and he always carries his phone with him. I really want to see where he is, especially when he is out with the kids. I worry about them. Tommy and I are really interested in each other just for good entertainment. 
I love Mark and I know that deep down Tommy loves Brittany. Getting pregnant with her was not in Tommy's plans, but when it happened, he accepted it and did the right thing. She is a very sweet person and I know they are good together. Tommy and I share the same needs. Don't get me wrong, Mark is a wonderful lover. He knows how to give me pleasure. But our lives are largely defined by the challenges of married life. You want to know why, if my life with my husband is so good, I have Tommy as my lover? That's a good question. It's really quite simple. Because I want him to be my lover. I need the attention he gives me. Tommy and I were a couple before Mark and before Brittany. He was the man I thought I would marry. I was in love with him, still am. But life doesn't always work out the way you dream. The reality was that Tommy and I weren't going to be married to each other, so I chose the second option. I met Mark and married him. Mark is a wonderful man. He is sweet, loyal, considerate, hardworking, caring, a great father and will work himself to the bone to do anything I ask him to do. So you ask, why isn't Mark enough for me? Why do I need Tommy? Again, because that's what I want. When Tommy and I broke up, it wasn't because I didn't love him. It wasn't because I didn't want to be with him. It wasn't because I didn't want to have a family with him. It was because he got Brittany pregnant and he had to marry her. Mark and Tommy complement each other. They both fulfill my needs. They both make me a very happy woman. With Mark, I get love and respect. He is so good, so honest, and such a perfect husband that any woman would be lucky to have him. I am lucky to have him. He is caring and attentive, and the physical closeness I feel with him makes me warm with my whole body. He is the perfect husband, the perfect father, and we have a deep connection that makes him mine. But I also have a deep connection with Tommy. The way I feel when I'm with him is something I don't want to be without. When he touches me, I fall into a state that is unlike anything else I've ever felt. He can do whatever he wants to me, and that's fine with me. Sometimes he wants me hard and fast and sweaty, and I love those moments. And sometimes he wants slow and gentle, and I love that too. We don't talk about our families that much. We spend time together just for ourselves, away from everything else. No worries about family or work or anything else. Just the feelings we get from each other during those few hours. When we are done, we shower, get dressed, and get back to the reality of our lives. I always check my phone before I leave Tommy's to see where Mark is. I don't need a chance encounter in a place that will be hard to explain. I return to my reality and Tommy returns to his. It's a routine that has worked well for years. I don't plan on changing it anytime soon. Mark. It's been almost two weeks since the day Jordan and Hannah told me the details of what Karen has been doing our entire married life. I feel like such a fool. She used me. And all this time she told me she loved me. All this time we had a life together, a family, a home, and a future, or so I thought. My hopes and dreams turned into a cloud of crap in an instant. My entire married life was a lie. Now the problem is that I don't know what to do. How do I deal with this? When I look at Karen, I see the woman I married. She is sweet, charming, beautiful, talented, hardworking, and a great mother to our children. Our children. Not really our kids anymore. Her children. Thomas Murray's children. I don't have children. I feel so violated. I can't talk to anyone about this. Jordan and I had a drink together three days ago, and he advised me to see a counselor. He gave me the name of one and made me an appointment. We'll see if that helps. Karen. I have noticed in the last couple weeks that Mark is very distracted. I have to speak several times for him to hear and understand me. He pays almost no attention to the kids. Andrea has to tug on his hand to get him to pay attention to her. He apologizes for not listening, but after a few minutes he seems to drift off into another world. He spends a lot of time at work and missed the school assembly we had planned to go to. I went by myself. He gets up very early in the morning and goes for a run. He usually runs for about 45 minutes and then comes home and takes a shower. Lately he's been running for an hour and a half before coming home. He has barely touched his food during meals and has not interacted with me or the kids except for little things. Mark. I went to see a psychologist. Dr. Marilyn Snow. She is a very pleasant woman in her 60s s and has a very calm approach. I explained to her the situation I was in and then told her how it made me feel. She asked if I was making any plans for the future. What am I going to do? Did I plan to confront Karen? Was I planning on getting a divorce? Was I thinking about forgiveness? I replied that I was all in my thoughts, trying to make a plan. 
I told her that my friend and attorney Jordan had advised me not to do anything until I was sure of what I wanted to do. Doctor. Snow agreed that was a good plan for the short term. But what about the long term? I still didn't have an answer. I knew that if the affair had been short, I probably would have forgiven her. But finding out that she'd never stopped seeing her real lover and that he was the father of her children was a punch to the gut that was hard to recover from. Even if I stayed with Karen, how could I ever trust her again? If I reconciled myself to the way things were, I would be content knowing that I would be her second choice in life, that I was raising another man's children, that she has cheated on me throughout our marriage. If Murray and his wife had separated or divorced, would Karen have run to him? That was my question. How can I be happy now knowing what I know? Jordan? It's been over a month since I last saw Mark and he wants to meet me at the office today. He said he wanted to discuss his plan of action regarding Karen. I met him at the door and we went straight to the conference room. Mark took off his suit and I handed him a bottle of water. He uncorked it and took a sip. So what do you want to talk about today? Jordan, I've been agonizing over this ever since Hannah told me about what Karen is really doing. I went to that counselor you recommended. She helped me see things from a different perspective. I tried to be honest with myself. I've been thinking about this whole shit show for a long time, and I think I've made some decisions. Good. What can I do to help? So here's my action plan. Mark detailed what he wanted to do. His plan was simple and straightforward, but at the same time he had some specific issues that needed attention. My job was to start the paperwork and be ready to file court requests. Mark had already been to his banker and had had a long conversation with his employer. Now it was a matter of details and deadlines. I needed Wolfie's help in the implementation phase of the plan. Two weeks later, Mark. Jesus Christ, it's hot. Turn on the air conditioning. So two days ago, I took the train from Albany to New York City and then the subway to JFK Airport. My Air France flight took almost 18 hours to get to my destination. I had to change planes and stayed in Paris for about four hours. Welcome to the United Arab Emirates. More specifically, to the city of Dubai. My new, for now, home. I have a new job with an engineering company working on a major project here in the UAE. So you're wondering how that came about? Well, in my business, we are constantly being asked to do engineering projects in many parts of the world. My boss was constantly fending off people trying to poach his engineers. But there are times when it is advantageous for an engineer to move to another company for a particular project. This is usually to gain experience in some aspect of the job and then bring it back to the company. This is just such a case. So I got a job with a UK company that was doing a major construction project in Dubai. The work was intense, but the rewards were great. The money and benefits were insanely great. My base salary was 100,000 dirhams a month. That's about 25,000 United States dollars. On top of that, there were also benefits. The real perk was that there is no income tax in the UAE. Yes, you read that right, no taxes. I don't plan on staying here for more than two years. Culturally, it's not a place where I will feel comfortable for an extended period of time, but who knows, things can change. I don't have a hard and fast schedule other than to work and make as much money as possible. The climate here is very different from central New York. It will take some time to acclimatize, the job comes with an apartment and a car. The apartment is ultra-modern, in a high-rise building with underground parking and all amenities. The car is a Mercedes E450. Of course, it's black and very fast. Not at all like my old Subaru Outback that I had in Albany. The company provided me with a helper. British. Her name is Amanda. She's about 28, 30 years old. Tall, slender, with long, dark brown hair, wearing black glasses and a muted British appearance. Her accent suggests that she comes from a more privileged background and is very well educated. She has a bachelor's degree in political science and a master's degree in international relations. She also speaks the local language. That will be invaluable. She picked me up from the airport and drove me to my apartment. I didn't bring much stuff with me. My old leather briefcase and one suitcase. I figured if I needed anything else, I'd just buy it. On the way to the apartment, she talked almost non-stop about the UAE, the city, and the people. She criticized and praised the UAE at the same time. I realized that the new job was going to be both challenging and possibly fun. When I left Albany, I knew all hell would break loose there. 
But that wasn't my problem anymore. Karen and her boyfriend had created the problem. Let them deal with it. Most of all, I felt sorry for the kids. I would have taken them with me, but I knew no judge would agree with that idea of separating them from their mother. But you want to know how it all ended in Albany? Jordan? My meeting with Mark took a couple hours. He brought some notes and a folder of materials to talk about. He wanted me to coordinate a few things for him at the same time. So, this is the finale for Karen Francis and Thomas Murray. Hannah found out where and when Karen and Murray usually met each week. Sometimes it was a hotel on the edge of town, next to a FedEx warehouse. Not one of the bigger or better known ones. They could afford it. Who said business was cheap? The magic of the place was that it was close to the highway, and they could get there easily. Murray had a buddy who would sometimes lend him a spare bedroom in his apartment to cut costs. They liked it a lot, but he didn't provide towels. Mark said he would pack his things in the morning and head to the train station. He was leaving the country. He didn't tell me where he was going, but I didn't need to know as long as I had his email address. He'd drop the kids off at school, and after Karen left for work, he'd come home, grab his bag, and catch a cab to the train. That's where Wolfie came into the plan. She was to prepare a packet of documents and other information for Karen and be ready to hand them over. Mark wanted us to wait until they were in the hotel room, and Murray was likely to fit in with Karen. The plan was to knock on the hotel room door, tell them it was the police, and open the door. When they opened the door, Wolfie would ask Karen for her ID, and after taking a picture of it, hand Karen a packet with the usual statement. You have been served. Wolfie was very good at this and managed to get a picture of both of them before she got out of there. In the envelope for Karen were the usual divorce papers as well as copies of the DNA tests that showed that Mark was not the children's father and that Murray was the father. There were transcripts of phone conversations between Karen and Murray in which they arranged their affairs and a couple of photos to prove they were caught. I was going to wait for Wolfie to call me and let me know that she had handed over the documents and then my next task would be to call Brittany Murray and let her know everything that was going on. I invited her to come to my office and I would be happy to tell her everything we had learned. Mark wanted to sue Murray to recover some of the money he had spent over the past eight years raising Keith and Andrea. But he realized that was unlikely. We discussed the pros and cons, and Mark didn't want Brittany and her daughter to suffer because her husband was an asshole. D-Day. Yesterday, Mark called me and told me that today was supposed to be D-Day. Mark called it that because it was the day he was leaving. He is leaving for a new life. I immediately called Wolfie and she came to my office first thing today to get the packets of paperwork and finalize her plan. Wolfie was very excited when she came into my office. I smiled at her and asked her, What got you so excited? This bitch was about to find out what the consequences would be for having fun with a man who had dedicated his life to her and, he thought, his children. She deserves every bit of what she's about to get. We sat at the conference table while I spread everything out in large envelopes and marked names on them. Wolfie and I chatted for a while, had coffee, and then she left to keep an eye on the building where Karen worked. A little after noon, she called to let me know that Karen was on her way. All I had to do was wait and be ready for Brittany Murray to call. Karen. I pulled into the hotel parking lot and saw that Tommy was already there. His SUV was parked at the edge of the parking lot. I parked and got out of the car. He got out and we met at the side door of the hotel. He already had the room key. I kissed him on the lips and holding hands we walked inside and took the elevator. Once we were in the room, we ended up on the bed. At that moment there was a loud knock on the door. I heard a very loud voice say, Mrs. Karen Francis, I know you're in there, please open the door. We both stopped and looked at each other and then at the door. What the hell? Mrs. Karen Francis, open the door or the hotel security staff will open the door. Oh shit. Tommy fidgeted, trying to find his pants and shirt. I grabbed what I could find and started getting dressed. The knocking continued. Mrs. Francis, we're about to open the door. Wait, wait, I'll get it. Tommy did open the door, but kept a chain on it so it couldn't open more than a few inches. When he did, we heard, Mr. Murray, open the door, please, or we'll open it for you. Tommy looked back at me and, seeing that I was only wearing my skirt and blouse, closed the door, took off the chain, and opened it a little more. The woman who had been banging on the door and yelling at us stepped inside and looked at me. Are you Mrs. Karen Francis? 
She had some kind of badge attached to the waistband of her pants. I nodded my head. I need you to tell me yes or no, please. Ah, yes. She stepped forward. I need to see a photo ID, please. I looked around, found my purse, and pulled out my driver's license. She took a picture of it on her cell phone. Then she handed me a large envelope. You have been served. She turned to Tommy, handed him the envelope, and said, Mr. Thomas Murray, you have been served. She stepped back and took a quick picture of the two of us, and then turned and walked away. What the hell was that? I looked at the envelope and realized my world had just collapsed. I knew Mark had found out about Tommy. His silence for the past few weeks now made sense. Suddenly, the room started spinning and I seemed to pass out. The next thing I knew, I came to my senses lying on the bed. Tommy was sitting in a chair looking at his cell phone. I got up and rushed into the bathroom and threw up, barely making it to the toilet. I waited there until I could stand up and then went back to my room and gathered my things. I have to go home. I walked out of the room without even looking at Tommy. Karen. I somehow made it home without causing a traffic accident and walked into the house. Mark, 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 where are you, honey? I went around every room in the house looking for him. I even looked in the children's rooms. He wasn't there. I went back to the kitchen and then I saw a white envelope with my name on the island. I opened it and in it was a single piece of paper and Mark's wedding ring. Shit. I sat down and unfolded it. Karen. By now you should realize that I know all about your years-long affair with Thomas Murray. I know that you and he were together before we were even married. If you have not yet read the documents you have been given, you should do so soon. There you will see that I know I am not Keith and Andrea's father. You have given this honor to Thomas Murray. That is what hurts the most, not being the father of the children I have tried to love and raise. Your deception was what broke everything. For that, I can never forgive you. Where does that leave you and me? Well, I left. I didn't bring much stuff with me, so the house and everything else is all yours. Jordan has some papers for you for later, but I signed over my rights to the house and the rest of our property. Considering how long you've been lying to me, I suppose you want to know how I found out about you and Thomas Murray. It was completely by accident. I was in a meeting at the same hotel where you and he were meeting for your entertainment. During one of the breaks, I was walking around and saw you and him getting into the elevator. You turned around to kiss him. You had the same look on your face that I had when I thought you loved me. How stupid I was. I won't contact you again so you can get on with your life and I can get on with mine. I'm sorry that Keith and Andrea will suffer the most from all of this. Your secret life will have an impact on them. Maybe they can get to know their real father and he will be a good father to them. I'll miss them very much. Goodbye. Mark. Tossing the letter on the counter, I walked over to the couch in the family room and sat down. I pulled out my cell phone and called Mark. The number you have dialed is not in service. Please check the number and dial it again. Damn. I called his office. The girl who answered the phone told me that Mark had left the company. She didn't know where he had gone or what he was doing. Shit. I called his mother. She had no idea what I was talking about. I thanked her and hung up. Shit. I finally opened the envelope with all the documents and started going through them. Everything was in there. All of my stupidity over the last 10 plus years, laid out in black and white, as well as a couple of full color photos. The DNA test results were in there too. I'd never tested the kids' DNA, but I knew they were Tommies when they started growing up and their facial features changed from infancy. What did I do? Mark. Jordan emailed me and told me how things were going with the exposure of Karen's affair. It was a difficult time, but I knew our life with her had come to an end. I could no longer look at her and believe that she truly loved me. I was her second choice. When I found out Murray was the children's father, it was over. I had to leave and never look back. I had already been in the UAE for a month and was almost fully acclimatized. I called my mother and father and told them what had happened. And although they were saddened by it all, they understood that I couldn't take the humiliation from Karen. I'm still young. I will find a new woman to share my life with. Jordan revealed that his relationship with Thomas Murray and his wife Brittany was strained. She called Jordan and then visited his office, and Jordan revealed everything she had learned about her husband's long-running affair with Karen. 
she hadn't yet made the decision that he knew of to send him away. Karen came to Jordan and demanded to know where I was. He didn't know himself, of course, so he wouldn't have to lie to her. Jordan made her sign papers to file with the court. Divorce papers and one special request that I wanted the court to approve. I wanted the court to order that my name be removed from Keith and Andrea's birth certificates. I wanted Thomas Murray's name on them. After much bickering with the judge and DNA records, the court granted my request. This meant that there would never be any legal questions about who was responsible for them. So far, life is very good here in the UAE. Karen? Being a single parent isn't everything. I have to do so much more to take care of the kids and the house. Without Mark, I have no one to share the work with. My dad has started coming over and doing some of the small repairs that Mark had to do. Dad comes in, does what he came in to do, chats with the kids if they are there, and leaves. He hardly ever talks to me. My mother and father found out why Mark left. They knew that before Mark, I was in love with Tommy. But they figured it ended when Tommy married Brittany. They had no idea that I had been seeing Tommy the whole time. Tommy's on a short leash himself. I haven't been with him since that day at the hotel when everything went to hell. I don't know what to do about the kids getting to know him. Is that even a good idea? The house and most of our savings are mine. But I still have to work and pay the bills. The court found that Mark is not financially responsible for the kids because they are not his. And I have kept it a secret from him. As for child support for me, the money in the bank is mine and I can use it as I see fit. Plus, I still have my secret bank account. Well, it's not so secret. Mark knew about it. I guess I really screwed the pooch. What am I supposed to do now? Six months later. Mark. My life continues. I miss Karen and especially the kids. But when I think about her, I just get angry at her and at myself for the whole marriage we have been cheated out of. So I do my best to stay busy and not think about her. My social life has resumed slowly, but it has resumed nonetheless. I have gotten to know many of the people I work with and have discovered some very talented people who work here for different reasons. Many are here for the money, many to experience a different lifestyle and culture, and some to recover from a bad experience. I am here for all of these reasons. Last month, I took a trip across the desert to an oasis on a motorcycle I bought. I bought a used BMW F800GS and outfitted it with some travel extras. There is a motorcycle club here that organizes weekend trips, so I signed up and went for fun and to see more of the country, not just the overpriced city. Amanda told me she really wanted to do something like this and I invited her along. She had never ridden a motorcycle before. And this was my first time taking a passenger. Oh, what fun. We had a great time. The organizer thought we were a couple, so when we got to our destination, there was only one room with one bed for us, and the hotel was full. We had to share. It was a little awkward at first, but we managed. I suggested we sleep on the floor, but she said that was ridiculous, and we would get by just fine with one bed. In the morning, I woke up with my arm around her waist. I didn't mean for it to happen, but it did. Then she headed for the bathroom. I heard the water turn on and then, Are you coming in or not? That's how it started. After that, things were different. Eighteen months later. Amanda. Mark and I went back to London to visit my parents. They met him last Christmas when we came for a vacation. My father is a banker and my mother is a teacher. They are well off and approaching retirement. They were curious about the American I told them I had brought home to introduce them to. My father wanted to get to know Mark better, so they went to a local pub for a pint or two and a chat. A couple hours later they returned and my dad was smiling and feeling more comfortable around Mark. My dad wanted to get to know him better and learn more about him. Well, he did. I'm sure he shared what he learned with my mother. So now it's summer, we're back, and we have big news for my parents. Mark and I are moving back to the UK. Well, it's not moving back for Mark, as he's never lived here before. He has a new job with a company, a big construction project in the Cotswold area. The money is big and we've decided to rent a house for now and maybe buy a place in a couple of years, depending on where we live. We need a house with at least three bedrooms, and I'd like a house with two bathrooms so we don't have to share them with guests. I'm selfish. The other big news is that I'm due to give birth in November. So we want to move in, get settled and sort out the medical issues, and get married. Oh yeah, that too. Karen. I have searched for Mark online almost every day since he left. 
I still have the letter he left for me in the kitchen. The children were devastated that the father they knew had left without saying a word to them. What could he have said to them to explain, Sorry, kids, but I'm not really your father and your mother is a lying, worthless whore and I'm leaving. Yeah, that would have been nice. I know I made this mess on my own. I see a therapist once a week and probably will as long as my health insurance will cover it. She says I've been deluding myself that I can have both men at the same time with no consequences. She said that I set Mark up for failure as a husband and father, and that's why he was destined to leave. She advised me to apologize to Mark and the children. It would be nice if I could find him. I don't have the money to hire private investigators, so I ask his family from time to time if they can tell me how to contact him. Mark's father tells me to back off. His mother won't talk to me at all. We live in a smaller house now. It's cheaper to run. The kids hate the place, but it's what we can afford. I drive Mark's old Subaru. It's still reliable and runs well. Mark. I tried very hard to forget that period of my life when I thought I was the luckiest guy on earth. Until I wasn't. If it hadn't been for my ex-wife's chance encounter with her lover that day at the hotel, I probably wouldn't even know about it now. But I did, and I had to do something about it. Ten years of deception is no small thing. How can you do these things? Look another person in the face day after day and tell them you love them and yet betray them. Stealing their love and giving it to someone else. How can you lie to your own children? I am certainly not perfect, and many will criticize me for the way I dealt with Karen and her betrayal. It was the only thing I could do and live with myself. My biggest regrets are for my children, Keith and Andrea. I hope they recognize their real father and that he can love them as much as I did. Karen killed my love. She poisoned that well. I couldn't look at Keith and Andrea knowing that they are only alive because of their mother's deception. They deserve better than that. I will do everything I can every day to be a good father to my child. Jordan. I understood the last words. Mark's action was radical. I thought he would regret leaving his children, even though they weren't his. He was in the delivery room when they were born and he raised them. He was the man they called Daddy. He changed dirty diapers, fed them, burped them, and was there for them when they said their first words and took their first steps. But I watched a friend who was deeply, deeply, deeply wounded by the betrayal of a woman who had promised and professed her love to him. She betrayed him in the most fundamental way, lied to him every day of their married life, hid that both children were not his. The only thing worse could be that she took a gun and put a bullet in his head. I understand why Mark left. As his friend and attorney, I supported him. I still get calls from Karen asking where he is and asking me to text him to call her or come home. I sent several such messages until Mark told me to stop sending them. So I did. Every three or four months I get a short letter from Mark telling me where he is and what is going on in his life. I know he is leaving the UAA for the UK. I know there is a new woman in his life and her name is Amanda. I promised not to say anything to Karen. I'm happy for Mark. He set up an education account for Keith and Andrea to help pay for college or university when the time comes. I'm the trustee. I will make sure they get the money when the time comes. On a more personal note, I got married. Yes, you guessed it to Wolfie. Well, my family and her family call her Hannah. She's pregnant and we're having a baby in December. I'd better forget her nickname by the time our baby realizes what it means. I don't want to scare the baby. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. So subscribe to my channel and watch the next video.